Welcome to Beyond the Balance Sheet, the podcast that helps advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families understand the complexities of issues related to our mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Our co-hosts, Arden O'Connor and Diana Clark, will interview a series of guests on a range of topics, providing informative content and practical tools for professionals and families to consider. Here are your hosts, Arden and Diana. Hi, and welcome to an episode of Beyond the Balance Sheet podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Sarah Lavelle, who is the owner of New York Health and Hypnosis and Integrative Therapy. She is also the founder of BeBetterEating.com. She is an expert, and I'm using that word, I don't know if she would, on the convergence between technology and therapy, and I am really excited to hear about how those two seem to go together and um, how AI has influenced her practice and what the upside and downside of AI in the therapy world can be seen as. So welcome, Sarah. I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, it's such a big topic. I don't even know what direction to first go in. I mean, I definitely can talk about the pros and cons. Um, and I can say that um, I am somebody who's actually on, uh, I, I have the belief that AI could is, when used appropriately, going to enhance therapy and not take away from it. So when you really think about the biggest hurdles to therapy, um, one of the biggest frustrations we have as therapists is that the people who need therapy the most are the most resistant to going. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many people say, hey, I, my husband needs to go or my child needs to go or um, sometimes a person from a certain culture, there's more social stigmas against it. Um, and so the biggest barrier to treatment is actually a lot of times self-selection and a lot of times feeling like um, I'm not ready to do this. I can't just sit in a room with a person I don't know and start talking. And so the idea is that we're not eliminating therapists by any means, but this serves as like an intermediate. And that's what we're already seeing is that therapy apps don't take away from therapy. Um, it actually, once people get used to using an app for therapy, they're then more likely to book an actual appointment. It's almost like they get a chance to practice it a bit before going, and then they get more that comfortable makes with it. Yeah. So give me an example of what an app might do. I've never looked at a therapy app. So I'm curious, what are you, what's out there and what, what have you seen? Well, there's a lot of different therapy apps. Um, one thing I would say is I actually think um, there are a lot of people, I think, misguiding people into calling themselves therapy apps. You know, when you think about it, a psychologist has to be licensed by the state. A therapist, um, MSW, LCSW, um, social workers, mental health counselors, anybody to practice therapy um, needs to be licensed in their state to be able to diagnose and to, you know, provide therapy. So I think there are a lot of people who don't really understand that you can't just call something a therapy app. Now, something could be interactive self-help that could aid therapy sessions. So again, when done direct, um, correctly, it could help somebody get into therapy. Um, but if you pretend that it's a replacement for it, I think that's where we get a little dangerous. So I think a lot of the therapy apps lie in a few different directions, right? One could be um, CBT exercises, right? Um, say a person has insomnia. What we do in a session is a lot of times we'd use CBTI, which means CBT for insomnia. And CBT and stands for? Cognitive for, behavioral uh, therapy, right? Okay. Um, and it's pretty systematic, right? So you could use an app to teach the basic principles of sleep hygiene, right? I wouldn't say it's providing therapy. I would say though that it's offering te some techniques that you could use in therapy. Now, say a person, does, like say it's marketed wrong and somebody says, hey, look, you can use this instead of seeing a therapist, but they don't realize that the person has depression. They don't realize that the person has severe anxiety or the person suffered from trauma. To call it a therapy app as opposed to a tool that teaches some therapeutic tools or something like that makes it sound as if you could diagnose them and that'd be a replacement. 
Um, I think there are a lot of really good therapy-based apps out there. Um, the other thing would be more AI type apps. Um, the app that we're creating, Be A Better Eating, again, we would call this interactive self-help. We would never say that, hey, this is actually helping you solve an eating disorder. What we would say is that this is going to teach you the principles of better eating and that you can actually talk to this all day. And, you know, a big thing with a person who does struggle with emotional eating, whether it's eating disordered or whether it's hey, you know, I kind of starved myself a little today so I could fit into that dress tomorrow, but then I binged after that event. Um, whether it's like this kind of mild form or more severe form, a lot of times you don't want to talk to your therapist about it. So if instead you can find yourself talking to an app during the week, again, it gets that way of like practicing and practicing, practicing, and the AI can learn more about you and it can learn your language. It can learn your habits. Um, and then ideally, you know, in the future, you could actually like look at everything you talked about with your app. You could actually throw it, show it to your therapist and say, hey, I'm not ready to talk about it. Would you look at what I wrote all week? And they can help you make sense of it. That's great. Tell me a little bit about the eating app that you are. Yeah, I'm, re well, I'm you're really excited about it. I want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't launched yet. Right now we're in beta, um, but it's going to be a phenomenal product. I mean, uh, I, I think so. Of course um, so the the idea is it's um you know everybody hears about generative AI or AI right and people use Chat GPT. Um, there's been a lot in the news. Um, I think most people have heard about like it kind of disbanded. Now it's back together. But the idea is that you're feeding it a knowledge base and then it can crunch that information. Now there's the knowledge base that it comes from. But you can actually have a separate database, um, your own vector database, where, for instance, ours is every blog I've ever written, every podcast I've ever done, every um, thought I've had that I want to add. We kind of call it Bia's brain, and we're loading it into that. So now when you ask Bia a question, it's not answering like ChatGPT. It's answering as if it was me. And so built into it, there's kind of the, we call it kind of the open-ended kind, that it's like, hey, you know, um, I want to know if this is a good thing to eat, if this is a bad thing to eat. And she won't respond with diet information. She'll say, well, let's think about it. How does your body feel after that? Um, does it feel good? Does it feel bad? She might give you some tips, but it won't be diet-based. It won't be restriction. It won't be calorie counting. So that's the completely unguided part of the app. The guided part of the app is broken down to three different activities. And it's still AI-based that so you're talking to it, but it's a little bit more structured, right? So one part of it is called knowledge and that's where you're learning more and more and more about your own behaviors and she's teaching you more techniques about mindful eating intuitive eating how to notice if you're hungry or full all these different things that are very research-based ways to not diet but to actually change the way you think about food um the second is called motivation and this function is hey i'm really struggling right now i really had a bad day I got in a fight with my spouse. I um, made a mistake at work. I just feel like binging right now. What should I do? And she kind of jumps in and talks you through some different exercises. How will you feel if you do it? How will you feel if you don't? Um, hey, let's do a one minute mindfulness exercise. Hey, how about what would you like to do? Would you like to go on a walk right now? Would you like to go for a run? Do you want to talk to a friend? And kind of thinking about all these alternative things you could do instead. And then she rates how you feel before and after doing the exercise. So you know, well, did this particular one really work for me or did this not work for me so well? Then the third component is meditation. This is um, guided hypnotherapy recordings we have by a professional voiceover that's going to sound a lot like Headspace except for the fact that they are systematically designed by us as a team of psychologists to help with emotional eating. So you'd listen to this nightly recording, daily recording, like you would a calm or a headspace, but it's even more specific for aspects of eating. And how long would that meditation be? So imagine I had a rotten day and I'm thinking about that pint of ice cream in the freezer thinking, I deserve it. I deserve that <laughs> pint. And I think, well, that's not really in my plan for well-being. I'm going to listen to this meditation. How long is it? And what will I basically hear? Uh, it would be three to five minutes. Um, they're very specific uh, Ericksonian hypnotherapy recordings. 
that we've created um, in our practice, New York Health Hypnosis and Integrative Therapy. We've been doing this for years, really specializing in eating disorders. So, you know, they're never going to say anything direct. The idea of Ericksonian hypnosis is that your body resists a message. So, for instance, if you were to tell somebody to relax, they wouldn't relax. They might even tense up. Mm -hmm. But if you tell somebody something like, you don't want to train the mind to stay on track, it's not worth the trip, they might think train, track, and trip without noticing that you're actually telling them to relax in a more subtle way. Um, the same things would happen in, in the hypnotherapy recordings. It might be um, a metaphor about two women walking through the woods and feeling strong and lean and feeling a little afraid there's not enough food, but finding out that there's plenty of food and they don't need to eat it all. They don't need to worry about scarcity. It's always there. What does their body need? So it would be very subtle messages into the mind that would promote relaxation, awareness of hunger and satiety, um, calm, and better body image. So it wouldn't be things like you're not going to eat right now or you're not going to feel hungry, but it would help you ask yourself, am I eating right now because I'm hungry or am I eating right now because I'm stressed? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what are the reasons that people tend to emotionally eat? What, what do you hear in your practice? I hear a lot of the same things. You know, it's um, the reasons might be all different. Anything that causes stress, right? So what are the reasons people could be stressed? Job, moving, financial concerns, a lot of relationships, right? Whether it's relationships with a family member, a loved one. Um, but it all rests on this belief that if I eat right now, it's going to make everything better. Mm -hmm. If I eat right now, it's this time that I don't have to think about anything else. And it's unconsciously, we feel like, hey, this is going to solve all of our problems. We know consciously it won't. But in that moment, we want to believe something will, and that something is readily available. And that's all we can focus on is getting it. And then people go through this, okay, now I got it. I should be happy. And they go straight into that shame cycle. So... I don't want to heal people's relationship with the food because I want to help them lose weight. I see how much people are suffering. Every time they make a decision that they regret, they feel horrible about themselves. And so I think most people that come to me, they say they want to lose weight, but really they want to get out of this binge restriction cycle that's le like wreaking havoc on their mental well-being. We just talked about that food might not be the answer to somebody's bad day. But the more I read about, let's say, oxytocin, that seems to be a more appropriate answer when somebody's having a bad day. How would the app address that kind of need instead of the food need? Well, the app actually wouldn't help you. It would help you figure out what makes you feel good. So it might say, okay, well, uh, the food isn't making you feeling better. Well, what kind of things made you happy in the last couple of days? Okay, let's focus on that. What about that did make you feel happy? Um, it might ask you um, what one part of the motivation part is, um, okay, right now you're in a moment of crisis. You think this food's going to make you feel great. We've already did an exercise that helped you realize it doesn't make you feel great. Um, here's a list of things that often help other people. I'm um, going for a walk, riding a bike, um, journaling. What kind of things right now might help you? And then it will refer back to that. And then I'll say, okay, let's do that then. Did that make you feel better? So it's not going to actually suggest something so specific, but it's going to help you figure out what are the things in your life that you can do instead. Um, that makes because sense. and more than that, making yeah, and making you realize that the food isn't going to help anyways. Right? right. It might in the moment, but then it's a it's a net negative because if it feels good for five minutes and it feels bad for the rest of the day, um, both physically and emotionally. Mm -hmm. You know, people think, do I need something else to replace it? Well, no, I think you need an awareness that it doesn't make you happy. Right. Right. So how did you get interested in this convergence between hypnotherapy, AI, or any of these more technical tools for supporting therapeutic work? How did you get interested in it? Well, I got interested um, because uh, several years ago, I moved when I had my six-year-old twins. And I thought, you know, I'm going to have to fly back to New York once a month because everybody, you know, this is before the pandemic. People really weren't um, doing things virtual. And what was interesting is 
when I started talking to my patients virtually for the first time, I started like they started opening up to me about what they were really eating. And I thought, okay, this is kind of interesting. I've been working with you for a year. You haven't, you've said, nope, I don't binge. All of a sudden I'm less real to you and you're opening up to me. Um, and the more I worked virtually, the more I noticed other people were having the same experience. And then I found that research as well, that there's something about feeling like the person's not a real person that allows you to like really open up. Um, at the same time, I had a friend who was going through a breakup and he was showing me this app called Mend. And again, like men don't always want to talk about their breakups to their friends or a therapist. It's kind of embarrassing. And this Mend is just a chatbot that you could talk to all day. And so he had said the same thing, that what I like about it is that it feels real. I could talk to it at any time. I'm not embarrassed to open up to this thing and I don't have to worry that I'm bothering it and I don't have to worry that it's judging me. And I kind of had this aha moment where I'm thinking, hey, my eating disorder patients, I'm already seeing that this is happening in therapy. Wouldn't it be great if there's this extension of me that they could talk to at any time and feel completely vulnerable with as opposed to me in real life? And then could it make our therapy sessions actually more productive when we did meet in person? And is it? It is, right? Um, I've only, only a few of my patients have had access to the app so far, but what I'm finding is people really feel like a little creeped out. They're like, wow, this really does sound like you. Right, <laughs> um, your voice but, is out of their phone, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like the kind of things that they would say, but also that they felt more comfortable talking to it. And then the idea is, okay, so one idea with like, for instance, relational therapy is, the more you can talk to your therapist, the more you can talk to your friend about something and your husband and the therapist serves as a model to how you interact in the real world. Now, if it could be a step before your therapist, you get used to interacting with the virtual therapist, which opens you up to your real therapist. And then that opens you up to other people in your world. But then it creates this, it stops that block between not being ready for therapy because it's a real person and, you know, uh, but I can take this small step and talk to something virtual. That makes sense. How similar is hypnotherapy to meditation for those who have never done either? Where is that? Very similar. From? There's a really good book just called Hypnosis and Meditation. And it's the first people, it's the first book anybody reads in the practice because it's um it really talks about the kind of like Venn overlay between the two of them. There you're getting into the same state. It's more what you do once you're in that state. So the purpose of meditation is getting into that state just for the point of clearing your mind and relaxing. Right? The point of hypnotherapy is getting into that same state, but because you're in a more receptive state, you're more readily able to concentrate on what you really want to change and re be receptive to a voice that's allowing you to make those change changes. So it's almost like meditation with a purpose. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. I went through hypnotherapy when I was giving up nicotine many, many years ago. Oh. And it, it was helpful. It was helpful, not initially, and not, I wasn't one of those people who went and came out and went, I'm never having another cigarette, that didn't happen. But the ability to get in that particular headspace carried over for me for years in terms of getting ability to do meditation or other kinds of, what is that, alpha or beta state? What's the state called, mm -hmm. one of those, yeah. Well, you call it the hypnagogic state in um, mm. in hypnosis, right? And it's kind of this, it's like the area between awake and asleep, right? If you ever notice that when you're falling asleep, they call it falling asleep because it's this feeling almost of falling and you're not quite awake and you're not kind of quite asleep. It's very relaxing. It's very it relaxing. Very mm. relaxing, yeah. Mm. All right, Sarah, what didn't I ask you? What would you like our audience to know before we close today? <sighs> I think um, I love dispelling any misconception about hypnosis. I mean, 
there's a lot of people out there that practice hypnosis that probably aren't doing it in a way that's truly like therapeutic, but, and I want people to know that hypnosis is something very well researched when combined with other therapies. So for instance, um, CBT, like I mentioned CBT I for insomnia is very well known for um, being kind of the number one therapeutic approach used by most practitioners for sleep. And yet CBT plus hypnosis always comes out significantly significant, um, almost twice the results as CBT alone. And there's a lot of things, um, same results for depression. Hypnosis alone can be too shallow, um, meaning you you might find a quick result with hypnosis, but without solving something underneath it, it's you you know you'll stop smoking and you'll start again, right? Because it's like, mm-hmm. say you're smoking because of anxiety, you quit smoking through hypnosis. A month later, you have a lot of anxiety, you might start again. So even if hypnosis helped you stop, it hasn't helped you put in the things in place to keep you from starting again. Um, eat, hypnosis is great for eating disorders. It's great for, it is great for smoking. It's great for sleep. Um, it's great for um, even managing things like the um, effects of infertility. It's not going to help you get pregnant, but it's such a hard time to go through um, managing the stress and anxiety and helping you get into a meditative state. Um, it's great for um, pregnancy fears and phobias, especially teaching things like hypnobirthing. Um, it's great for helping a person overcome the effects of trauma. It's helpful for a person who finds themselves in bad relationships and helping them to reflect on their patterns. There are a lot of things that hypnosis are extremely effective for. Um, at the same time, very much getting people away from believing that it's a quick fix. Um, I also want to help people not be so afraid of AI at the same time, realizing we need to put things in place so it doesn't get out of hand. It could be a very effective tool, making things cheaper and more accessible. But when people conflate AI for things it can do and can't do, uh, I think that's where we can get into some danger. That's clearly in the news what it can't do and what it can do and how terrified we all are of it. But like any other tool, I think it can have a good purpose. Yeah. I think so too, when done correctly. Right, right. Well, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate you joining me today on Beyond the Balance Sheet. For the listeners who found this conversation interesting, like me, Please like us on your platform of choice, but more than that, do a little digging on your app store and look at the apps for some of these and and explore a little bit. I think you will find yourself pleasantly surprised. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Balance Sheet, a podcast designed to help advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families solve some of their biggest medical, psychiatric, and emotional challenges. Visit beyondthebalancesheet.com to read more about our guests and resources and sign up for our newsletter.